I came to IU Northwest in 1992, and I was hired as an animal ecologist, in particular doing amphibian animal ecology. Oops, wrong way, sorry. And so we studied salamanders, newts, toads, and frogs, their breeding, their reproduction, their predator-prey interactions, all in natural wetlands, and the students liked this. And I did that, counting the time before I came here, for over a quarter of a century. But during the 1990s, I started to learn that Northwest Indiana and Northeast Illinois were once the greatest ecological area in the U.S. As in terms of biodiversity. The problem was that nine and a half million people now call that area home. So what, what's left of that ecological gem is broken up, tattered into small little parts, and was badly degrading. But I learned again in the 1990s that people were working very hard to restore this ecological gem. So I thought uh, as we turned the century that IU Northwest should play a role in this and started changing our curriculum to uh, uh, help students prepare for these uh, challenges. Now why are we the greatest ecological gem? Location, location, location. We're at the crossroads of climatic patterns coming at us from the north, from the south, and from the west. It sometimes make, gets us frustrated with our weather here, but it's great for ecological diversity. And then all the same, Lake Michigan is trying to temper the whole system. Now this map shows that we are only have two eco-regions here that's not very diverse, but really we have components from the deserts, from the Great Plains, from the south, from Canada even, all are really here. So in fact, we're really a crazy quilt of different habitat types and this creates the great ecological diversity that we have without any mountains to speak of. We're very, very flat in general. Well, I'd like to give you a brief look into three of these special kind of habitats in Northwest Indiana. And the first one's called dune and swale habitat, which is a washboard kind of appearance of over 100 sand dunes in parallel lines they were only about five feet tall, these dunes, and wetlands separated the dunes, and they existed from about Miller and Gary to Dalton in Illinois. And you can see from the picture in 1930, there was a lot of this left. The Gary Airport was gonna go right in here. By 1962, you can see there was very little of this dune and swale habitat left, but some of it has been preserved. So it's very diverse in some places, the Wetlands are really wide and have many, many plant species. Other areas, they're narrow and more aquatic. Orchids absolutely love this habitat. Gary was known to have thousands and thousands and thousands of these showy orchids in downtown Gary, but of course they're not there anymore, but we can restore them. Now, in one of my classes, we took a walk down this trail and censused all the plant species that were there, cut across, repeated our effort. You'd think that would be a clone. Two ridges right next to each other should have the same plants, but they were 25% different in species. So these tiny little regions can have great diversity. Another habitat that we have is oak savanna. Two types, black oak savanna on sand dunes and burr oak savanna more on a clay soil. They're very, very diverse, and, but they had started to become overgrown through neglect, and so we had to start working stewardship. Here are some pictures from a prescribed burn in Marquette Park in Gary, and the savanna is coming back to life there if we do the kind of restoration work we need. And third, we have the tall grass prairie. And the first picture shows a picture in June, and then one in July, and then one in September. Every week, the diversity of flowering plants changes in the tall grass prairie. So we started changing our curriculum in biology so that we could train students to work in this area. We did classes that go out and do work with the global company, the Nature Conservancy, to make sure that students knew what was being done. They work on lots of different techniques, including on our own campus preserve. Students gain tons of experience. Of course, as you just saw a moment ago, prescribed fire is a big tool to restore uh, ecosystems and a natural agent in these ecosystems. So here, we're getting ready to burn a woodland in Hobart over near uh, the old Hobart High School. And then here's a crew getting ready to burn our nature preserve. A few of the students have worked on as many as six different burns, getting a lot of experience. And here are some pictures from our burn this past March. Students uh, enjoy this and they can 
have little promotional moments there and they know all about fire. They've been trained and they can do this and, not know, that, and know that they're not going to get uh, burned up. Our graduates then go on and like tentacles in a web start spreading out all this good restoration work. Jessica here has become a major player in Northwest Indiana restoration effort. She's now moved to an 8,000 acre nature preserve about 50 miles south of us where she's a major restoration agent in that uh, prairie, whoops, including the area where the bison roam free, not to be for slaughter, but just to do their function like they used to back when India, Indiana first became a state. Joel works up in the Calumet region and is a major uh, worker in the restoration area. This nature preserve, you might think it's up in Michigan somewhere, but it's right on the border of Gary and East Chicago, and it's about 400 acres of almost the most beautiful habitat we have. It's a little hard to get public access to it now, and someday there will be good public access to it. Uh, meanwhile, Dr. Avis, uh, Gail Tonkovich, and Wyatt have started something called NERMI, Northwest Indiana Restoration Monitoring Inventory, where they train students to go out to dozens and dozens of nature preserves in our area and quantify the effect of the restorations in those uh, various habitats. And last but not least, we do our little bit here to make a nature preserve by the campus. And one of its special features is that it has many, many, many microhabitats from dry soil to wet soil to sunny to shade. And it's been a treasure for us to work on getting all the different plants uh, in those areas thriving. Some like the wetlands, of course, very showy ones in the wetlands. We have carnivorous plants like these that eat small animals in the water or other wetland plants that just help pollinators and some of you may have heard that pollinators especially bees are suffering nowadays and the tall grass prairie i mentioned before 99.9 percent .9 of the original tall grass prairie is gone now the short grass prairie of colorado that's doing a lot better but the tall grass prairie of iowa missouri illinois Indiana and a few other states is almost gone, but we're doing our part to bring it back. Of course, animals benefit from our uh, efforts in all the nature preserves. A good example is this white false indigo plant. It's a host plant for about five or six different species of butterfly caterpillars. We can have butterfly gardens providing nectar, but if we don't give the babies food, which are mostly native plants, we're not gonna have butterflies. And then a few times we've had sandhill cranes raise their young right next to our student parking lot here. So we're very happy about uh, the, the uh, restoration work that's done in Northwest Indiana. We're doing our parts. If anybody wants to learn how you go find these preserves, just send me an email and I'll give you a path to finding them all. Thank you.